Woo! How are you guys doing? Come on, let's go. Some of you still in your turkey coma? You doing all right? Doing all right? I love it. I love it. Some of you had some good food. Some of you had some food. Wasn't so good, but you just kept your mouth shut, right? Come on. <laughs> I ate a lot of food. Come on. I ate so much food. It was so good. In Jesus' name. The, uh, we, had, we make these uh, things called pumpkin bars and uh, pecan bars. Pecan pie bars. That's what they're called. Yeah. Whew. I could eat a whole pan of those things with my ice in my milk. Thank you very much. For all you milk people that don't like that, I don't, I don't really care, you know? I like my, my milk cold, and uh, I enjoy it that way. And some of you are like, well, it gets, it gets watery. Well, not if you drink it. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> all right. That didn't have anything to do with anything. I was just thinking about Thanksgiving, and I hope that you had a blessed Thanksgiving. I really do. Um, God is so faithful to us. And as we come to this season of our lives, whether it's around Thanksgiving or as we lead into Christmas, my heart is that you'd be reminded again of not just, not that life is always easy, because we all know that's not true, but we, we know this 100% is that God is with us. God is with us. And that, my friends, is a good thing. And that is what can cause us to live lives of gratitude, even when things are hard. So, all right. Well, we are continuing a series today called The Blessed Life. And um, we basically are in the fourth week of that series. And some of you love this series. Some of you don't like this series, and that's okay. Uh, but you, you, some of you keep showing up. And, and I think that's good. Uh, because I truly believe this. Even if I was preaching to one person, I truly believe that if the church can get this right, it will radically change not only the individual's situation, but it will radically change the impact that the church can have in the world. 100%. And so for me, that's why I dedicate so much time to it, because I fundamentally believe this. I also believe this as well, is that some of us struggle with it. Even believers in Jesus Christ, maybe you've been in the church a long time, you still struggle with this topic. And, and what I want to do today is I want to try my best to help you understand what God's Word says so that you can be free. Because here's the thing, we can buck against it, we can fight against what God's Word says, but the problem is, is that we never win that, do we? Like, we just don't. Like, God's like, like if you just hold your breath long enough, <clears throat> but maybe, just maybe, God's going to be like, okay, you're right. You know, it just doesn't work that way. And so this is one of those principles and truths as we, as we go through this series, a truth about generosity, about who God is, about his very nature. That's what I love about it. Like generosity is at the very heart of who God is. Like it's in his nature. And we see that so clearly in his willingness, in his willingness to send his son Jesus Christ into the world. I don't know about you, but I don't remember the last time you gave your son or your daughter. You see what I mean? Like God loves us significantly that he was willing to do that. So today we're going to start or we're going we're gonna to be in week four of the blessed life. And today I'm calling this sermon, Am I Generous? The question. Like if you were to ask yourself that question, am I generous? How would you answer it? You might say, well, yeah. Or and sometimes, you know, not all the time. Uh, or, man, I nail it all the time. I'm, I'm always generous, you know. Praise God. If I was honest, there are times I'm generous and there are times that I'm not generous. But I know it's my heart and I believe it's God's heart that if I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, that I'm a generous person. I know that the Bible teaches that. So this question seems relevant to all of us. Am I generous? If you ask somebody that loves you or knows you, that, you know, spend time with you, like ask them, like, do you think I'm a generous person? I don't know what they would say. Maybe they'd say, absolutely. You're absolutely the most generous person I know. Or they'd be like, no, you're, 
Not at all. Matter of fact, you're worse than Scrooge. Like you go to a whole nother level. Because I don't know anybody. Have you ever met anybody that would acknowledge or just, just stand up and say, hey, I struggle with greed? I've never had anybody come to me as a pastor and be like, pastor, I've really been struggling with greed. Can you help me with that? It seems that nobody thinks they're greedy. So I think that is the reality that we all live in. Now, I want to just tell you something that really blesses my heart. Uh, and I've seen it happen recently in, in more significant ways than I've seen in the past. As a pastor, one of the things I love is to watch people grab hold of this principle of tithing. Like, I love to see somebody get it. But it, one of the things that recently has just blessed my heart is watching teenagers get it. Like recently, we've been seeing teenagers who are honoring God with the tithe. I just love that. I've been, I mean, I look at the giving units sometimes, and, 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 and I just see that there's more teenagers in our church that are tithing unto the Lord. I don't know about you, that's amazing. I love that. I love that when a kid goes to his work or his teen goes to work at whatever job at Wendy's or whatever, because I don't know, like, that's where I worked when I was a teen. I don't know where you worked, but you know, and you get your paycheck and the first thing that goes through their head is not, where am I going to spend all this? That the thing that goes through their head is I'm going to honor God first. Yeah. I love that. And so if you're a teenager here today and you're doing that as your pastor, I want to commend you for that. I want to say good job because I can tell you this. Now, absolutely. Because I can tell you this. You are starting off right. You are on a path that will lead to blessings. And I guarantee it because God says it's so. So well done, all of you that do that. Well done, anybody in the room, like anybody in here that's honoring the Lord with your tithe. I just want to say, well done. Matter of fact, I love being a pastor of a church where people do that. I love being in an environment where there's generosity stirring among us. I love the fact that by a numeric value, okay, churches our size, similar size in attendance, our budget is probably two or three times more than many of the churches I interact with. Why is that? Because people have caught the revelation that God is a God of generosity and he is committed to blessing his people if they will honor him first. And we see that with our budget. We see that in this church. And so I just want to say I'm proud of you. I'm proud of all of you that do that. Matter of fact, I was talking to a young person the other day and they were telling me about how they had to work on Thanksgiving and, and, and they were working a lot on Thanksgiving and, 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 and they were getting tips for the work that we're making and, and they were asking the Lord what they were supposed to do for this legacy offering coming in December. I'm like, this is so cool. And, and so they made the decision based on what they heard God say that they should give their tips to the legacy offering. And this, this young person tells me that they made like $180 or something in tips. And they were like, giving that to the legacy offering. How cool is that? I just love when people catch this because you know what that young person knows? They know that if they'll honor the Lord, that God will do what God says he'll do. There's something powerful about that when you catch that at a young age. Some of you in an older age haven't caught it yet. But I pray today, I pray to God today that you will hear what the scripture has to say. Not what I have to say, but what the scripture says. Because if you will follow what the scripture says, the Bible says that you will be blessed. Because did you know our God is a rewarder? Have you, read Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. The Bible says that God honors those of faith. Yes? says so it pleases God when people have faith. But then he goes on to say that he is a rewarder of those who seek him diligently. He is a rewarder. Our God is a rewarder. So in other words, even if you don't want to be re rewarded, God will still reward you if you do it his way. Like you can be like, no, God, I'm good. He's like, no, here you go. Because he's a rewarder. That's what he does.
I love that. I love that, that, that God is always working in that kind of way towards us if we'll honor him in this way. You guys okay? You ready? All right. Well, let's look here at John chapter 12. John chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, turn to chapter 12 of John. I want to start reading here in verse 1. Then, six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who was, or was, where Lazarus was who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. That new King James sometimes gets me. In other words, what he's saying is, that's where Lazarus was. He had been dead, but now he's not dead. Verse 2. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. So the guy that got resurrected is now sitting at the table with the one that resurrected him. Get it? Verse 3. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. Everybody say spikenard. Isn't that a good name? I love that. I think some of you should name your child, your first child, spikenard. It's biblical. Call him Spike. Or I guess you could call him Nard. That'd be weird. Don't call him Nard. And so this very costly oil of Spike Nard, she, she takes a pound of it, and the Bible says that she anoints the feet of Jesus and wipes his feet, listen to this, with her hair. Get this. Now, that may not seem significant to you. It may seem weird. You're like, why in the world would this woman wipe this man's feet with her hair? Well, in the Bible, especially in ancient times, in the ancient Near East, a woman's hair was considered her glory. So, so, so what's happening is she's taking this very expensive oil, she's pouring it on the feet of Jesus, and she's taking her glory and wiping his feet with her glory. That's powerful to think about it. Now, going on a little bit further, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Have you ever had a concentrated perfume or something like that? where it just, it just, like you open it, and it's just, it just fills the whole place. So you can imagine this fragrant oil that's been poured out. Then in verse 4, here's the contrast. Look at the but there. There's a but in verse 4. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, this is what he said. Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now, for all the people in the room that seem to relate to this question. I mean, think about it. This is 300 denarii, which at that time was an entire year's wages. Get this. An entire year's wages, friends. She takes an entire year's wages and pours it on Jesus' feet. And Judas stands up and says, are you kidding me? We could have taken that money Sold, or I mean that oil and sold it and gave it to the poor. Now, does that seem illogical? Does that seem unreasonable? Well, no. I mean, in some ways it seems reasonable. But then watch this in verse 6. We get a little clue into what's going on with Judas. So he asks this question, this righteous indignation that comes up in him, and he says, why didn't we take this and give it to the poor. Sell it and give it to the poor. And then verse 6, watch this. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box. And look at this. And he used to take what he put in. 
So John gives us this insight, this little insight into Judas and his heart. And so when he asked this reasonable question, why didn't we take the oil and sell it and give it to the poor? The Bible says, wait a second, there's something else going on here. Because see, in this particular passage of scripture, John is trying to contrast two individuals. One is the woman and the other is Judas. And so you see this sharp contrast right in front of your eyes. And what's really being said is that there are two different hearts here. There are two different hearts that are existing in this passage of Scripture. And it, it begs the question, why did Mary give such an extravagant gift? You ever thought of that? Like, why in the world did she do that? Well, let's put a pin in that. We'll get back to it. But why would Mary do that? Then number two is why did it bother Judas so much? Like, why was he so upset? I mean, he knew Jesus. He knew what Jesus was up to. Why was it such a big deal? I mean, he had heard Jesus talk about the extravagance of God and his love and all those things. So why in the world was Judas so upset? These are important questions. But the Bible is clearly contrasting these two people because I believe there are two different hearts on display. One heart is a heart of generosity and one heart is a heart of selfishness. These are two things that the Bible is trying to help us see that exists in this passage of Scripture in these two individuals. And guess how it's being revealed? Through giving. Through money. In other words, money and giving is actually the thing that is revealing what's really there. Does that make sense? It's so important we see this because what, what John is trying to get us to see is that in this process of loving Jesus and, 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 and doing what she felt was right to do, God is lifting her up and saying, this woman got it right. But at the same time, he's contrasting with Judas. And how many of us in the room, come on, let's be honest. How many of us in the room are like, really relate to Judas? Like, no one's ever relating to Judas. We're like, yeah, that guy's a dirtbag. I don't ever want to have anything to do with Judas. Matter of fact, let's just forget about him. All right, just, just let's, let's talk about Judas. Because I, I don't have any interest in that, right? Because I've never met anybody that's like, I have the spirit of Judas in me. <laughs> like, no one's doing that. Every time I read the scripture, I never see myself in Judas. Do you? I don't know. I, I just don't. But... I think Jesus is trying to get us to see something is that you may not be Judas but you may be asking similar questions that Judas asked because your motivation because your heart because there's something going on that's leaning towards selfishness and not towards generosity so I think it's a relevant way for us to start as we talk about three different things about generosity three different things about generosity the first is that the enemy of generosity is selfishness the enemy of generosity is selfishness because here, here's an easy way to remember it God starts with a G yes yes Satan starts with an S yes God is generous. Satan is selfish. See, very simple. Very simple. Because see, God is the most generous. And Satan is selfish and he's a thief and he comes to kill and destroy. And so here's the thing that we have to understand. That at the heart of the human spirit, without God, without Jesus, is a tendency towards selfishness. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, I've talked about this before, but like you get like little kids together, right? And you get like a little one and maybe it's your little one or whatever. And, and I don't know what it is. I mean, it just seems like they're kind of born with it, right? Go figure. And, 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 and what happens is you're sitting in the dining room or the living room and your kids are playing with other kids in the back room. And... You, you know you're, you know how you like you can be present but also be listening if you're a parent so you're present you're listening and you hear this shriek 
in the back, you know, it, 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 like you could feel it going up on your neck. And you're like, that's my kid, right? There's a, there's a moment where you're like, that's my kid. And the kid is saying this, mine, mine, give it to me, mine. <laughs> now, I know none of your kids have ever done this, but, but, but there's this moment and you as the parent are like, oh my goodness, I have to get up and deal with this child and their selfishness. So you go, and, and you see it, and inevitably you go, and there's a little bitty one, and there's an older one, and the little bitty one is taking it from the older one and saying, this is mine. And the older one is frustrated because there's no justice in giving her that because it's not hers, it's his. And that little one is just going, mine, mine. Right? Now, at that moment as a parent, you have a choice. You either go towards justice or you go towards peace and quiet. <laughs> and sometimes you just give up and you say, you know, I'm tired of this. I'm not, I don't have any justice in me today. Just give her it. Just give her it. It's hers. It's, it, no, it's mine. It's mine. No, it's hers now. But dad, it's mine. No, it's hers. Just give it to her. She has plenty of my stuff too. Just give it to her. <laughs> we know this picture of selfishness we see it so clearly in children don't we but the thing i've noticed is we don't always see it in ourselves it seems like the older we get we we, we seem to be less familiar with selfishness or at least the varieties that, that adults can come up with but yet we see it so clearly. Because if you saw an adult going, mine, 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 you'd be like, whoa, this is weird. Apparently the mother never, or the father never helped this one. And they became 40 and still are saying mine, mine, and mine. But it would be weird, wouldn't it? It would seem out of place, out of order. And I think that most of the time we're a little bit more covert with it. But ultimately, we know what this looks like. We know what selfishness looks like. We see it in our lives. We see it in children. We see it even in our lives today. And see, here's the thing. God's hope for us is that we'll grow out of it. Like he really does. Like part of the training is to help you grow out of it. But the thing that I've learned is that we don't always do that. We don't always grow out of the selfishness. And God comes into our world in this conversation of generosity, and he says very clearly to you and to me, the tithe is mine. He's very clear. The tithe is mine. Now, we can disagree with him, we can say, no, that's not true. We can say, that's old hat. We can say, that's Old Testament. We can say whatever we want. We can come up with all the excuses. But ultimately, God is very clear when he says, the first 10% is mine. And our job as believers in Christ is to then return back to God what is rightfully his. We're not here to sit around and think we're confused or that somehow the tithe doesn't belong to God. God's been very clear about this matter. And all of the theological and practical gymnastics that we do to kind of create some smokescreen that it's not true is just not helping you. It's not helping me. Because ultimately, if we will honor God in this way, he will show himself faithful. So Judas asks this question. Here's the question. Why wasn't this sold and given to the poor? Seems like a reasonable question. And in some ways, it seems like it's noble. You know what I mean? It seems like a noble, reasonable question, except that John tells us that it wasn't noble at all, that his motive was impure, that his motive was bad. Matter of fact, not only was it bad, but that he was also a thief who was stealing from the offering. That's not good. This pastor told a story one time. He was, he was driving another pastor around 
and they were in this neighborhood and the neighborhood was a, a neighborhood with big houses you know and with lots of land and so they had these big houses on land and ponds and all kinds of fun things you know and and they were driving by this house and one of the pastors says to the other one he says man that is a really big house and the pastor that was driving him said well that's one of my church members that's one of my my people and and the 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 other pastor says well that's a big house and I kind of think he should sell all that and give it to the poor. And this pastor was frustrated by that because he knew these people. He knew what they gave. He knew how generous they were. So he kind of goes off on him. You know what I mean? He's like, you don't have any idea what you're talking about. You know, uh, these people are extremely generous people. And, and matter of fact, you're, you seem to be basically saying something that Judas said that they should somehow give or sell everything they have and give it to the poor. And, you know, of course, this pastor's a little taken back that the one pastor called him a Judas. You know, nobody likes to be called Judas, right? But he recognized that there was a problem. And the pastor that called him a Judas said to him, I said, if if, if you're so committed, why don't you sell all your stuff and give it to the poor? (laughs) Right? You see how this goes. But the point of that story is that sometimes what we see as extravagant, what we see as excessive, isn't always extravagant. It might be extravagant to you, but it may not be extravagant to them. It becomes a relative thing because here's what I've figured out with Christians a lot of times and people in general is that for a definition of extravagance, I'll just just say it like this. It's defined as anyone who has more than you do. That seems to be our mark for extravagance. And so anybody that has more than you, that's extravagant. If they have a nicer car than you, that's extravagant. If they have a nicer house than you, that's extravagant. If they have better hair than you, that's extravagant. I don't know. But you see what I'm saying? Is, is, and then here's the, here's the problem, is that if you somehow end up in their neighborhood, You're no longer extravagant. Somebody else in another neighborhood is extravagant because you're not extravagant because, I mean, they were extravagant, but you're not extravagant even though you're in the same neighborhood now. You see, it becomes a relative thing. And and I think part of this, and and it's, it's why we do it. It's like when you see somebody drive a nicer car than you or they have a nicer car. Like there was a time, and I'll just, I'll just tell you this. I sold it because I wanted to make some money on it, but I bought a used Lexus. Can a preacher drive a Lexus? Oh my goodness. Come on. I remember there were people, I would literally drive places and people would come up to me and they would be like, whoo, Patrick, live at large. I mean, I mean, stuff like that. And I, I remember it was so interesting to me that someone would be so, they know nothing about me. And yet, that's their assessment of me based on the fact that I was driving a used Lexus. Now, I don't know. I found this to be interesting. Like, my used Lexus was not that expensive, but, but, but here's what I know. That you could buy a pickup truck that was 50 grand, and everybody's like, cool truck? Don't say nothing. Now, if it had a Lexus sticker on it, all of a sudden, oh! <laughs> Extravagant! I mean, it's, it's funny to me, the things that we ascribe, and we know nothing about the individual. We know nothing about what they're doing. Now, I'm not saying that some of us aren't selfish. That's why I'm preaching this message. But at the, at the, at the same time, there are many of you in here that are extremely generous people, and God has blessed you, and there's nothing wrong with that. You should never, ever apologize for that. Because I know this, regardless of what the world says, if you'll do it his way, he will bless you. I don't care what you want. He says he'll do it. And so here's a question I have for you. As you look at this story of the woman and Jesus and, 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 and Judas, who gave Judas the offering box? Jesus. Like, literally. Matter of fact, Jesus even knew he was a snake. Jesus knew he was a thief. 
Matter of fact, it says when he chose him. In John, it tells us that he knew he was a thief. And Jesus gave him the box. Now, for all of you leaders out there, you know, business people, you own your own business, whatever it is, you know, if you were leading a company, would you give the box to a thief? No, that would be dumb to give that. Like, this person just got out of prison for embezzlement. Uh, like him to be my CFO. It's going to be awesome. Right? Like, this is what, so Jesus gives him the box. And I, I think that's fascinating because the Bible says he's a thief. He was stealing out of the offering. Like, they were in a traveling ministry. People would give things. He, he was collecting those things, and then he would stick his hand in it and take it for himself. That's what was happening. The Bible calls him a thief. Do you know there's another place in the Bible that talks about being a thief? It's in Malachi. When, when God says to the people of God, why are you not honoring me with the tithe? I told you in the first place it was mine, and yet you're not doing it. And the result of that is the prophet saying to the people, you are thieves. You have stole the tithe from me. I don't know about you, but what that means is, is that somehow the Bible is now comparing Judas to a thief and a thief to someone who doesn't tithe what rightfully belongs to God. Now, you might say at this point, Pastor, that's a really harsh thing to say. I know. But am I wrong in saying that's what the Bible says? Now, you can get mad at me. You can quibble with me. You can say whatever, like you didn't turn that phrase right or you offended me because you talked about children that way or, you know, you can do all that. But you can't get away from this reality that this is what the word of God says. Jesus places the offering box in the hands of a thief. Why? Because I believe, and I think the scripture shows us this, is that Judas had the opportunity to do the right thing. So God gave him the opportunity to do the right thing. He gave him the opportunity to deal with his own weakness, his own selfishness, and yet he chose to put his hand in the box. Now, if I were to ask you, if, if we were sitting in service and someone passed the plate, right? We were having an offering, the plate goes down the row, and as it's going down the row, like somebody in your row, you see it, right? Somebody in your row grabs a $100 bill out of the offering and sticks it in their pocket right? Would you be offended by that? Would you be bothered by that? Of course you would. Who's doing that, right? I mean, who's, who's stealing money from the offering box, right? No one does that. Now, unless you're just really off your, you know, I wouldn't want to be on the side of that deal, but I'm just saying, like, but most, in general, anyone in here, you're like, no, I, I'm not doing that. I wouldn't do that. But here's, let me phrase it differently. Imagine, even though you wouldn't stick your hand in the offering box, is it possible that you do a similar thing when you keep a tithe in your bank account? Because see, the Bible says that that belongs to God. Come on. Amen, pastor. That's so good. I'm just loving this. Keep, keep it coming. But that's what the scripture says. And so, so when we keep it and it's God's, it belongs to him, then I would suggest to you that it's the same thing as us thieving and stealing. And God says to us, not okay. So, so here's the thing. Generosity is affected by selfishness. As a matter of fact, it kills it. But here's the, last, here's the second thought, is that, that, that generosity can also be extravagant. It can also be extravagant. Because isn't that what we see with the woman? She was so extravagant in what she gave. Did you know there was a point in the Bible, if you use the economics of it and, and do the inflation and get the, the, the money right, that there was a point where David gave a billion-dollar offering to God? That's a, that's a big offering, isn't it? 
I mean, I don't know about you, but that's pretty significant. And, and God was pleased with that. Then there's another place in the Bible where there's this woman that has two mites, two coins, and she gives of that to God, puts it in the offering, and God says, I love that. So, so in other words, it wasn't the amount, was it? It wasn't whether it was a billion or whether it was two pennies. It was their hearts. It was their abandonment to the fact that God is worthy, that God is, is ultimately worthy of this kind of generosity, this, this extravagance. And, and that's what we see in the scripture when it comes to Mary, that when she shows up and she does what she does, this is significant. This is extravagant. This is one of those things that everybody should take a look at and say, holy moly, this is amazing. And that's what we see with her. And so let me ask you this question. If God told you to give a, a year's worth of your wages to him, what would you do? <laughs> I don't know about you, but, but I'd be like, I'm not sure I heard from the Lord on that. I had some indigestion that day, indigestion. But it was that that impressed God, wasn't it? He was impressed by this kind of behavior. Look, in 2 Corinthians 5.8, it says this, and not only as we had hoped, but listen to this, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. What, what, what Paul is trying to say is that, look, they've done a lot, and they've, but, but what is most impressive is that they first gave themselves to the Lord. And I'm going to say something right now that's going to sting. And I, so just be ready for it. Here it comes. It's not the amount that you give. It really is about your heart. But don't tell me that God has your heart if he doesn't have your money. See, the Bible says that wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. Do you understand what that means? And so I hear people say all kinds of things all the time. God, I love you. I love you first. I give you first. But in some ways, what happens is we don't honor him with the tithe. And here's the thing. There are three levels of giving in the scripture. Just stay with me. Three levels of giving. The first is tithing. The second is offerings. And the third is what you might call extravagant offerings. Or some preachers call them, or some people call them painful offerings. <laughs> Right? Because those extravagant offerings, like when God shows up and says, give a year's of your wages, you're like, whoa, oh, hey, that hurts. You know what I mean? And so, so here's the thing that I know. As you look at that level, if you look at tithing, if you look at offerings, you look at extravagant offerings, the Bible teaches this, that, that most, listen to me here, this is hard. Most Christians never get past number one. You're like, that's, a, that's absurd, Pastor. I see churches with all kinds of stuff, right? I get it. I understand that that seems absurd. But I want to give you the facts. Is this okay? Can I give you the facts? Jim Collins wrote a book called Good to Great. Heard of this book? Well, one of the things he says in, in this book is if you're going to be a great company, you have to be willing to look at the hard data. You got to look at the facts. You can't ignore the facts. And here's what the facts say to us, and this is important that we see it, is that most Christians never get past level one. Most Christians never even get to level one because only, listen, five to seven percent of Christians say they tithe. Five to seven percent, which what that means is, is that 93 to 95 percent of Christians never get to the first level of giving. They never get to the first level. And now why is that important? Well, guess what's attached to the tithe? The blessing. And so here's the thing I know. I absolutely know this, and this is the good news. If you honor God with the tithe, you'll get to step two and three. But if you don't give God the first, you will never get to step two and step three. Does that make sense? This is what the Bible teaches. This is not what Pastor Daniel teaches. This is what the Bible teaches. 
And so my heart for us as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, is that we would get the curse off of our life so that the heavens can open up and the abundance of God come pouring into our lives. And the way that we do that is honoring God with the tithe. That's what he says. Now, I don't know about you, but that's good news. <laughs> But for some of us, it's not great news because we feel the conviction of the Lord. And I just want to say to you, please feel the conviction of the Lord, but do not feel condemned. Do not feel shame. But allow the Holy Spirit to convict you where you need to be convicted so that you can come to God and be healed. And don't live this way anymore. And finally, I'll end with this. Why do you think Mary gave such an extravagant gift? Well, I'll tell you why, I think. Two months before, her brother had been raised from the dead by Jesus. In other words, there was a gratitude in this woman. She, she was grateful because she saw Jesus do something that no one else could do. And as a result of that, this, this gratitude wells up inside of her and turns into generosity, and it's a year's wages that's now being poured out on the feet of Jesus. And guess what she didn't know when she was doing it? She was preparing Jesus for his burial. She had no idea that's what she was doing. And as she pours out this oil, preparing Jesus for his burial soon to come, that as she is placed in the story of God as a woman of faith and as a woman who was willing to give extravagantly to God. Such a beautiful thing. Now, I don't know about you, but when you hear that story, sometimes you're like, well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have any spike nard. You know, I, I, matter of fact, I can barely make ends meet. And so when I hear you talk about these extravagant gifts, give a year's wages. are you kidding me, pastor? What's wrong with you? I get it. I understand the dilemma. I understand the difficulty of trusting God when it's hard. Come on. I'm not immune to this. I'm just like you. But do we trust God or don't we? Are we willing to put our faith in him or not? And the Bible says that we should do it in this area, absolutely. And the gratitude that we see in Mary is the same gratitude that he wants in us. And you say, well, I, my brother was not resurrected. Well, here's what I have to say. And this is important. Are you saved? Is there anybody in your family today that's saved? Then what I want to say to you is that you have something to be grateful for. You, you have something to be grateful for. You're like, well, I've never been raised from the dead. Oh, well, wait a second. Hold the phone, right? Because Ephesians 2, 1 tells us very clearly that you've been raised from the dead. It, it, it's very clear. And you, he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. So in other words, I was dead in my trespasses and sins. And so if you're here today and you've experienced the gloriousness that comes from that, then you have something to shout about. You have something to be uh, grateful for because when I was trapped in my sin and my trespasses, when I was in my death, God reaches into my death and brings me to a place where I am now alive. And that's what Jesus has done for me. So when we're thinking about gratitude, when we're thinking about tithing, when we're thinking about giving God our all, I think maybe, just maybe, we should turn back to this reality that he has raised us from the dead. That we've experienced the same thing that Mary ha had experienced and that these extravagant offerings, these tithes, these whatever, God... It's yours because you're worthy because you've done everything for me. And then in Mark 14, 9, I'll be done. Listen to this. Same story, different place in scripture, different place in the gospel of Mark. The Bible says this about her. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, 
what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. We, we live in 2022. We're almost about to 2023. Isn't that crazy? Huh. The Bible has been talking about this woman ever since. Like literally in churches all over the world, this woman is lifted up as an example of extravagance. Like, do you think in that moment when she was pouring out that spiked dart that she thought somehow that her story was going to connect with God's redemptive story in such a way that they were going to be talking about her thousands of years later? <laughs> no way! And yet God says, I want to lift her up to you as an example of what it looks like to honor Jesus. And I want to... <laughs> push down the example of Judas because it's not the right way that wrapped up in Judas was selfishness and wrapped up in her was generosity and God says be like her and here's the thing that you have to see and I know this is the hardest part but stay with me if you won't take the first step to honor him with the tithe which belongs to him you will not get the curse off of your finances and in turn you won't get to two and you won't get to three and my heart for you as a pastor I really I really believe this is that you take this first step come on like I I don't want your money please please don't let that be anything in your heart. I really don't. It's not something I want from you. It's something I want for you. And as a pastor, don't you think it's in my heart to want everybody in the church to be blessed? Of course it is. And so guys, listen to the word of God and do what it tells you to do. And you will experience that. Because here's, let me ask you this. Do you think God is a liar? I mean, seriously, do you think he's a liar? Then trust him to be faithful to exactly what he says he'll do. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your word, for how it shapes us and challenges us. Oh, Lord. For those in the room that are, have fallen under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, God, I pray for mercy. I pray that as they have these last moments with you, Lord, that not only that they would feel the conviction, but they would move to you. They'd move towards you in faith. They'd begin to repent and, and pray and ask the Lord to help them. Matter of fact, I want to pray for anybody in this room that would say that that currently that is not their life. They are not honoring you in this way. I want to pray specifically for you. Perhaps you want to take that step of faith. And, and so what I want to do is just pray against the enemy who wants to convince you that you can't, that he convinces you to fear, that on the other side of it, God is a liar. Did God really say? Of course he said it. And so, God, right now, I pray against the enemy that tries to cloud judgment. I pray for greater wisdom and discernment that the people of God would hear the truth of God's word and move towards it in obedience. For anybody in this room, you'd say, I want to do that. I want to do that today. God, I pray for power. I pray for faith. I pray for trust. For that individual that wants to make that step, God, I believe in faith. And I wanna, I wanna just say something to you. Don't wait. Like, do it today. Like, pull out your phone at some point and send that text, that digital gift. Do it. Write that check. Don't wait. 
Because I can guarantee you the moment you walk out of here, the enemy's coming for you. And so in Jesus' name, I pray for faith to take steps towards this. And that the tithe of the Lord would be brought into the holy place. And that there would be heaps and heaps and heaps. There'd be more than enough for us to do the work that you've called us to. God, I thank you. Jesus, we thank you. I want to invite you to stand for a moment. For anybody in here, as we spend just a moment in worship, I want to invite you to get prayed for. Perhaps you're here today and you're sick and you just need somebody to pray for you. Prayer, prayer people, why don't you just go ahead and make your way over to the tables over here to my left and my right. And I just, anybody in here that, that, that you need prayer today, you need prayer for sickness, you need prayer for something happening in your family, you need prayer to, to, be, to, be, to be faith filled with your tithe. Or maybe, just maybe, if you left here today, you know that you know that you know that you don't have a relationship with Jesus and that you would not spend eternity with him. I just want to invite you to go and move in that direction. And so as we sing this last song, I want to invite anybody to step out and get the prayer they need because I believe God wants to minister to his people right now. Jesus, we thank you for your presence among us. We invite you into this moment and we ask, Lord Jesus, that you'd speak. We're listening. And so, Holy Spirit, speak. Bring conviction. Bring comfort. Whatever it is, that we might respond to it. We love you, God. We praise you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.